As I take your Bibles this morning, we're going to go to the Word of God already right away. Um, we had a, a sermon bumper, but it just really felt that we wanted to take some time in the Word today. Look at the person beside you and say, where's your Bible? <laughs> get your phones out, get your Bible. So I, I'd like you to put your finger in Genesis chapter 45. We'll go there a little later. Uh, It will be on the screen as well. If you don't have a Bible or you're watching online, uh, you'll see it there as well. But I want you to kind of uh, get ready because we're going to look at uh, 15 verses, 14 verses actually in Genesis. Um, And I'll try to read that without commentating as I go. Uh, Otherwise, we'll be here too long. Because it's it's a foundation for... A series that we're doing, we're calling it Nations and Generations. So it's a three-part series. Um, We serve a three-part God. We sang it this morning, three persons in one, the Trinity. And so it's interesting how God establishes us as three-part beings. We are a spirit, we have a soul, we live in a body. And he established himself in the people of Israel, the people of God that he chose. He said the Father, he, he was representing uh, themself through, through God the Father, which is Father Abraham. So the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, which represents the son. Remember, he was going to be sacrificed. The son, it's interesting, these images and the symbolism in the Old Testament. And then Jacob, who had the one with many sons. He had 12 sons. We're focusing on Jacob's sons this morning in this message. So a few weeks ago, we looked at Abraham. Last week, we looked at Isaac's uh, two sons, uh, boy, how many people know that's timely for what we're doing in the world today? And uh, we're going to follow up a little bit of that this morning when we look at Jacob's sons. Nations and generations. Today, specifically, the message is called On the Road to Better. Would you say that with me? On the Road to Better. I know it's a Grand Canyon picture, but that's my only desert picture I could find that had, an, had somebody traveling through it. So we'll use that this morning. It's not Israel, by the way. I think that's Arizona. Exodus chapter 3, verse 15. We'll start with this scripture. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, which we'll focus on, has sent me to you, This is my name forever. Even in 2023, this is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. Here we are in the 2023 generation. Whether you're a boomer, an Xer, a builder, a millennial, Gen Z, Gen Y, LMNOP, I have no idea. We've got so many generations all at the same time. No matter what generation you identify yourself with, um... God is the same God. Amen? I have a task before me, and I thank you for your prayers. I thank you for praying for me. Thank you for praying for my family. I'm grateful for that. As I delve into this text today, I do so with humility because I really believe I want to discuss something with you that God has already discussed with me. He's been talking to me about this in a pretty profound way, dealing with those things in my character, He has spoken to me, asking me, am I willing to continue to grow and change in this area of my life? You know, you get along in life in your Christian walk, and you kind of think, yeah, I know that one. I know that scripture. I know this. I know that. We think that we we know enough just to get by, but the reality is uh, the gospel of Shrek, there are layers. He wants to go deeper. Now, if you're thinking about onions and layers, then it's going to make you cry. But if you think of cake and layers, it's going to make you happy. So God wants to go deeper, deeper, deeper. And that's the goal today. And I pray that together we all will be edified. Father, this morning, thank you for the truth of what your word is going to say to our hearts. But mostly, Lord, we are asking for the courage to live out what our hearts are telling us through your word. And even as Ken has prayed earlier that we would leave differently, but Lord, I want to add, we'd also live differently. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So when it comes to our understanding of our Trinitarian God, especially in these times, 
identifying ourselves with the great need that's in the world, and we see the catastrophe all around us, and we hear the, you know, the hashtag WW3, we think that, you know, we thought Ukraine, Russia was World War III. Now it must be Israel and the Middle East is World War III. <sighs> Take a breath. Be not concerned so much about those things. I know we love end times teachers. We love somebody telling them about the book of Revelation. You know what I believe about the Revel book of Revelation is you begin to believe the last preacher you just heard. And if you keep hearing more teachings on the book of Revelation, you're, you will constantly, yeah, that's true. I believe that now. And you hear the next guy and you hear the next guy. And how many people you've heard maybe three or four, five, six, seven different kind of end times teachings before. And every time it's different. Anybody want to admit that sometimes it's not really clear what's going on in these last days? So let me suggest to you that if you're addicted to end times teaching, uh, which some people are, let me ask you to go beyond that and go to the God of the end times. His name is Jesus Christ, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and be more focused about the revelation of Jesus Christ, which is what the book of Revelation is all about. It's not the revelation of bombs and wars and, you know, the beast and the mark and how many people get, you know, ah, that's a dragon, that's this, that's this, and the Antichrist. And, but the book of Revelation says in the first few words, let's look at it in your own Bible, this is the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we should be seeing more about Jesus. That's my goal this morning as we understand that God himself, who reveals himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which I've already said, um, we are in the danger of claiming to know more than we think. We are genuinely believing things that are not really certain that they are the way they are, because there's a lot of things that we don't know about the end times. Apparently, the Father is the only one who knows when Jesus is coming back. I find that weird. Jesus doesn't even know what the fa father, father's got a secret from Jesus. I don't know. Don't unpack that with me today. That's not where we're going. But how many times, maybe if Jesus doesn't know when he's coming back, that we probably can't predict it either. Would you agree with me on that? So sometimes we claim to know more. And so a lot of times our, our unwavering certainties, which cause a lot of dogmatism and legalism and division in the body of Christ, we believe certain things. And so sometimes we even fight over those beliefs. And I think that's just very sad. It fosters strife and division amongst those who've been called together as the family of God. In this context this morning, the call is for profound humility as we enter these these texts. Much like the prophet Ezekiel, and I find this to be beautiful, Ezekiel says something that is so amazing. When confronted with a vision of utter devastation and horror and war, the end times picture, he was asked by God, can these bones live? Despite the profound nature of Yahweh's power, Ezekiel could have answered a million different ways. But you know how he answers? He responds by saying, Lord, you know. His response reflects not only a deep humility and a refusal to act as though his own opinions were of great worth and the sacred acknowledgement, hear me carefully, of his own ignorance. Ezekiel was okay to not know everything, but he was certain he knew a God that knew everything. Amen? So in a world where certainty breeds discord because we have all kinds of opinions about what's going on in Israel right now, all kinds of discord, which is evident in the marches and in the, my goodness, online, don't go on Twitter in this time, it, you, you, your head will explode. It is not a healthy space to see all the anger where ideology outweighs truth. Perhaps there's wisdom in yielding to, I'll call it sacred ignorance, where it's okay to go, I have no idea. Now, our finite human comprehension is limited, but our God is not. So let's look at what God is saying to us specifically. So we, the collective us, all of us together, and those of us online who are joining us, will not truly comprehend everything that's happening in the Middle East, in Israel, Palestine. And if you have an expert that tell, will tell you what's going to happen, they're probably not going to be accurate. We do not know, but what we do know is that God knows, and that should be enough. 
I want to pause right there. (sighs) Father, you know we do not. Help us to be okay with that. All right. So with every country that's boiling over right now, and to every age group, generation, to every age throughout all the ages, he is with us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. I'm going to move quickly through this text in Genesis as we see some amazing things on the road to better. This is Joseph on the road to better. Becoming a better person does not happen overnight. You have a desire. By the way, is that every you know, new year comes along, we have these great intentions. And so we make these resolutions to ourselves and we want to be better people. You know, I never hear people say, I want to eat more cake. That's my goal in the new year. Uh, you know, you probably will make that one happen, but we always pick things that are good for us. So it's hard sometimes to change things. But when God thinks of change, when he thinks of changing us, when he thinks He's not looking for instant change in our lives. In fact, God doesn't look at persons and seasons. He looks at nations and generations. And so Genesis 45, verses 14 to 28, we'll read this together. Again, I'll try to keep my comments to myself. Then he fell. This is so this is in the context, and I'll show you in a few moments here of all the different places where the story of Joseph outlines. But Genesis chapter 45 is in the context where Joseph now meets his brothers who were in Israel and there's a famine in the land. And this is Joseph seeing his brothers after everything he's been through. It's pretty emotional chapter. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin's wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Now the report of it was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brother have come, so it pleased Pharaoh and his servants well. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, say to your brothers, do this, load your animals and depart, go to the land of Canaan. Bring your father and your households and come to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you will eat the fat of the land. Let me pause there. Was Pharaoh kind of tricking them? Hmm, not quite sure. Let's continue on. Now you're commanded to do this. Isn't that interesting? Joseph's been given a command to be a blessing. Take carts out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and your wives. Bring your father and come. Also, do not be concerned about your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. Wow, what's going on here? Then the sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them carts according to the command of Pharaoh, and he gave them provisions for the journey that's on top of all the blessing. He gave to all of them, to each man, changes of garments, like new clothes. But to Benjamin, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. Let me just put that 300 pieces of silver in today's context. That's about a quarter of a million dollars. How many people know? That's a blessing. Benjamin. Any Benjamins in the house? Yeah, there probably is a Benjamin in this house. All right, let's continue. And he sent to his father these things, 10 donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt and 10 female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, food for his father for the journey. So he sent his brothers away and they departed. And he said to them, see that you do not become troubled along the way. Then they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to Jacob, their father. And they told him saying, Joseph is still alive and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart stood still because he did not believe them. Continue on here. But when they told him all the words which Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent to carry him, watch this, the spirit of Jacob, their father revived. Watch this now. Then Israel said, everybody say that with me. Then Israel said, So the spirit of Jacob was revived. And then Israel said, Jacob and Israel are the same people. Remember Jacob, 
So it's the flesh. It's the human part of him. And then Israel, which is the spiritual call upon him, said. So the spirit of Jacob was revived. And when the spirit of Jacob was revived, then Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Wow. This is a fascinating story in the midst of so much of the scripture. And I spoke about Abraham and I sp- about his sons and I spoke about Isaac and his sons. And now we're looking specifically at Jacob and his sons. And we recognize that Jacob had this issue of forgiveness. And so he and his brother were fighting and it wasn't until forgiveness, which was last week's message, um, could o- that could be the only thing that can resolve generational hatred, interfamily hatred. Forgiveness is the only way forward. Now, it's this week as we look at Joseph, and we could have pulled out of all these texts. Look at, look at here at the blessings that came, the blessings of God that came upon Jacob's household, all the sons, Jacob's or Joseph's brothers. And the intention was this was to be shared generationally. Hang tight. Let's jog through these chapters real quick. Watch this. So it begins by Joseph dreams in chapter 37. So Joseph has dreams. The brother hate him. So it's applied against Joseph. Chapter 38. We'll skip that. It's about Tamar and it's not about Joseph's story. 39. Joseph's success in Egypt. But then Joseph is imprisoned. We know that story. Joseph interprets dreams. Chapter 40. 41. Joseph's made a ruler of Egypt. The sons of Joseph. Great stories there. Joseph's brothers sent to Egypt. Could have talked about that this morning, chapter 42. And Simeon is held hostage so that Benjamin would come. Interesting story. Verse 43, the return to Egypt. Joseph sees Benjamin. The brothers are brought back. Verse 45 is what we'll talk about more and specifically, which we read from. Joseph deals generously with his brothers. This is interesting. So this term generosity just rises in this chapter. Verse 46, Jacob moves to Egypt and the family who came to Egypt. In verse chapter 47, Jacob's family settles in Goshen. There's a lot of chapters dedicated to Joseph's life. In Genesis 45, which we just read, Joseph's dream is finally realized. He went from the pit to the prison to the palace, but the road to better was not easy, nor was it simple. It wasn't a straight path. How many people you've gone through things in your life, ups and downs and difficulties and challenges? How many people know the the road forward is not always easy? Joseph himself experienced terrible things. Years of betrayal, hardship, loneliness. But Joseph held on to his persevering love for family, for his family. Even though everything that that happened to him, yet he persevered because of the dream of God and because of his love for family. Even when his brothers did him wrong, Joseph only knew how to respond with a radical love offering. Quarter million dollars is a radical love offering. True? He was a giver, not a taker. He kept his better angels at his side throughout the journey. We'll talk about that later. But my question is, what about you? On the road to better, what about you? What are you overcoming? What are you going through? What hardships are you having to deal with? What heart stuff's going on in the difficult things in your life? Joseph, when he finally gets the upper hand, so to speak, because his brothers definitely, as they come to him, are definitely in a subservient position. Joseph does not seek revenge. He seeks reconciliation. What does he reach for? Vengeance or love? When you finally prosper, when you get past what you're getting through, when you get blessed of the Lord with whatever definition you want to put that blessing in, I'm not talking about material blessings as much as this story indicates that. I'm talking about when you know that you've been blessed by God. What do you do with your blessings? What do you do with the very good things that God does in you, for you, through you? What do you do? Do you, are, you, are you filled with greed? Are you a hoarder and keep all those good things to yourselves? Or is your heart filled with generosity to want to be a blessing? What will you be remembered for? Joseph will be remembered for the great generosity 
that happened so that the family of Israel could prosper, could return to the land, and that God would establish his name in Israel forever from generation to generation as we read earlier. At the same time, we're not always going through things well. How many people, you have bad days and it feels like the bad day one? I need some water here because I'm going to... Thank you. How many people had more than just a bad hair day? How many people feel like your bad day, your bad day feels like a bad week? How many feel like sometimes my bad week feels like a bad month? Maybe you're going through a bad life. Now, I'm not sure what you're going through. But God's calling all of us to the ro- on the road to better. And let God speak to your heart about what that means. So we see all these things. And even if we blow it, even if we don't make it, even if we have low days, hard days, tough days, I want to put this on the screen. I want you to write this down. God does not define you by your low moments. He defines you by your high calling. Those bad days, the, the, the blooper reel of your life, right? Well, everybody's compar- you're comparing yourself to everybody's highlight reel. You feel like you're inferior, you're no good. Oh, man, my life's crappy compared to these people. Listen, everybody's showing you their highlight reel. They're hiding their blooper reel. So don't let life or people define you by your low moments. We have AA who meets in our building every Wednesday. And it's interesting to me, they'll sit there and they'll go, hi, my name is, I'm making it up. My name is Joe and I'm an alcoholic. So there's a a definition of their name being identified with who they were or who they're trying, what they're trying to overcome. And that is good for us to do, but how many people know If I met Joe outside of the AA meeting, I would say, hey, Joe, the alcoholic. How many people know I would not be labeling him or defining him by his low moment? You understand what I'm saying? I'd be calling him to his high calling. I know there's some, a lady who was at the church we were at before, and she would go to AA, and she found her higher power, and she, she eventually found when she came to her church that the higher power was actually Jesus. It's amazing. She began to have a small group, an abide group. She went to hearing God, and then she wanted to lead a small group. You know her, Cheryl Ann. She's amazing. And so no longer is she leading, hi, my name is Cheryl Ann. I'm an alcoholic. Is hey, I'm Cheryl Ann. I'm a believer in Jesus, and I want to help you abide and grow in Jesus. So the call of the church is a high calling. It's a good thing. God does not define you by your low moment. He defines you by your high calling. Going back to Genesis chapter 45, and we see verse 15, that second verse that I read, it says, then Joseph Keach kissed each of his brothers and wept over them. This was a mark of Joseph's heart. This was a sign that he was not hard. He was a, the ability to weep over and with his brothers. They wept over him and he wept over them once the, he, they knew who they really were because they didn't recognize Joseph initially. I call this Joseph's tears. Tears of joy mingled with compassion. He that sows in tears will reap in joy. The story of Joseph is mostly about sowing while weeping, giving, and then eventually reaping. See, what's interesting about Joseph's life is that no matter what you hear about his story, it's not documented this way. And I think it's not documented on purpose. That when he was thrown in the pit, do you think Joseph cried? I would have. I think I, there have been a few tears. My brothers don't love me. They're throwing me in the pit. Or when he got in prison, it doesn't document once that Joseph shed a tear. I guarantee he did. He's human. Like, he's not a superhuman. He was an ordinary person, I'm sure. But the point is, they did not document, the scripture does not document the fact that these difficulties related to times of weeping. But here it is, finally, at that place of great victory, the place of great blessing, that tears roll down his face. Tears mingled with love, wet love, joy and compassion in his heart. 
and it's documented. It's very emotional. This chapter is very emotional. And so we see that, and I'll write this down as point number one for you, because it's in my notes as number one, but it, I want you to get this idea. The call to Joseph was to give generationally, not just generously. There was something more going on here that broke open the heart of compassion in Joseph's life, that there was the plan and the purpose of God being revealed in the moment where he embraced his brothers. Give generation like Jennifer Luke chapter 6 verse 38 says, Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. Or some translations say, King James, men will pour into your lap. People will give to you. For with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. How many people have heard this scripture at an offering time? In the context of what Luke 6 is, it's about forgiveness. The whole thing that we find this verse is that if you give forgiveness, it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be forgiveness poured into your lap. There's this grace thing happening here. It's a beautiful thing. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. It works with finances. But I'll be honest with you. This is about forgiveness, which I think is at a higher level, the high calling of all of us as followers of Jesus, to live in that place of forgiveness. Joseph's life demonstrates that. Power of forgiveness. It's odd that there's so little preaching of this chapter that we just read in Genesis, on this part of Joseph's life. Because to be honest with you, I think the harvest of faithfulness that came through the suffering of his life is actually something to highlight. And it rarely gets preached about. More is taught on the suffering and sacrifice than we do the harvest of persevering love. We speak about his dreams. We see how he was abandoned, abused, tempted. Potiphar's wife, mistreated by those that were apparently his friends in prison, but we don't speak how he came to the end of these sufferings. He traveled the road to better. He did not stop. He not only survived, but this story shows he thrived. He was above. He was the head and not the tail. He was victorious in so many different ways, and his latter days were greater than his former days. True enough. Despite a rough start and a raggedy middle, ultimately, in the end, God resolved everything. The road was bumpy, but God brought him through. Isn't that good? Today's text is filled with raw emotion, much tears. But it's because Joseph had an understanding that generational legacy must continue. So he gave generously. Now, somebody said to me, one time, well, it's easy for him to give all that away. It was Pharaoh's money. It wasn't his money. How you you thinking in the back of your head? Yeah, that's well, yeah, it wasn't his money. Anyway, he just gave that away. No, he was responsible. And Pharaoh trusted him. And he could do whatever he wanted. And Joseph was a blessing. With all that God had given him, Joseph became a blessing. I think at the end of our lives, it would be amazing to be remembered as, wow, they were a blessing. Would you agree with me? So we see Joseph, now the prince of Egypt, he's still a Hebrew boy, literally a son of Israel. The text shows how God works through a dysfunctional family. You think your family's dysfunctional. By the way, put up your hand. Everybody put up your hand because I'm going to ask a question. Just go ahead and put up your hand before you even ask the question. Go ahead. Come on, some of you rebels, put up your hand. Your family's dysfunctional, right? Yeah, okay, see, yeah. You think our, your only family is the only one that's dysfunctional. Uh, I told you, you're seeing their highlight reels. You're living in the bloopers. The text shows how God worked through a very dysfunctional family to accomplish God's divine purposes. Jacob was tore up from the floor up. He was broken. Jacob was completely broken. Even though he had the call to be Israel, he lived in the reality that he was still Jacob with all the brokenness around him and the dysfunction of his sons hating each other, killing, he thought, right? All the mess that was going on in that family. 
son's treacherous dealings with Joseph caused him to age prematurely. It says he was very old age, in his old age, but he wasn't really that old. Raising children that were fragmented and disloyal to each other. Maybe that's your family a bit. I don't know. But I will use two words. But God. But God steps in and as Joseph says, watch this. You intended harm to me. This is Genesis 50 verse 20. You intended harm for me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. The saving of many lives, nations and generations were at stake. It's beautiful. And the story picks up where the demonstration of grace in this chapter 45 is demonstrated in an abundant generosity was bestowed upon brothers who probably really didn't deserve it. Anybody really deserve the grace and favor of God? No, we don't. But God's lo- God loves you anyways. He loves you unconditionally. He loves you no matter what. By the way, there's nothing you can do to make God love you more. And there's nothing you can do to make God love you less. You know, breaking news, alert, news alert, you know, the banner, the, whatever that thing's called at the bottom. God loves you, period, no matter what. It's not always demonstrated in your life through others, but Joseph demonstrates the kind of love that God has for all of you. And it comes to the second thing, this second idea in Joseph's life that I see is that there is a grace of giving. The grace of giving. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7 says it this. New International Version says, but since you excel in everything, wow, that's a compliment. In faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you. So they had to learn about how to do love properly, obviously love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. So all these things that God wants to do in your life, through your life, faith, speech, knowledge, earnestness, love, but he also wants you to excel in this grace of giving. We're, we're innately selfish human beings. We don't naturally just give, unless you're like a toddler and you're sharing but then even toddlers don't always share their toys in the sandbox. You don't have to teach kids to be selfish. Mine! Mine! Anybody watch Finding Nemo with your grandkids, your kids? The seagulls are humanity. Mine, 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 mine. That's just who we are. So when the Spirit of the Lord captures our hearts, that's when generosity can flow. You're looking at me like that was weird. Sorry. But grace, this generosity, this, this grace, uh, or, the, or the, the grace of giving is not just something you think about, not just something you feel. It's seen and heard. It's a celebration. This kind of grace is a celebration. Generosity is a celebration. Offering time is a celebration. We get to give to the Lord that woohoo! This is something we get to participate in expanding the kingdom of God. Come on, I can't wait for offering time. Where's the plate? Oh, we don't have plates. Oh, yeah. Where's the e-transfer? Oh, it's on my phone, right? Whatever it is, we're excited about participating in what God is doing. It's a celebration. And by the way, people that are non-celebrants are haunted by Christians who love to give. I won't give names, but I've, had, I've seen family arguments where they're trying to stop their mom from giving to the church. Fights break it out because they don't know about the joy of giving. You can't stop that mama from giving because she finds joy in the house of the Lord. I'll tell you, non-celebrants have, it's just noise to them. But it's a free-flowing party of gifts and favor. Grace celebrates. Despite our weak attempts at the excuses that we try to bring to our Father, grace still shows up in our lives with all the good things that God has for us. In fact, all grace needs to hear, all God really needs to hear is, Father, forgive me. 
and the prodigal son story, that's it. He just needed father, forgive me. And the father was all over him. The response of the father, he didn't need all the prodigal son's excuses. Well, you know, this and that and blah, blah, blah. blah, blah. No, no, come on here, kid. And grace embraced him and celebrated the son that was lost, but now is found. Giving like our rejoicing can get a little noisy. And the father's heart displayed in the prodigal story is that he gave gifts. He gave to the prodigal that which he didn't deserve, but joy is in the heart of the father. We see that kind of grace upon Joseph. We see Joseph giving grace, favor to his family. See, he wore a coat. You know what that coat was called? The coat of many colors, the coat of favor. So he wore favor, but it was not just his coat. It was his character. The brothers may have taken his coat away, but they could not take his character away. He was still filled with grace and favor. He had the kind of monogamous ability to, to the, gen, the generous capacity, I'll use that word, to be able to not seek revenge, but to have a radical kind of love for people who've taken advantage of him. It was tough. It was tough. And he was able to withstand the temptation to keep the blessings to himself, because he could have, but rather, like the prodigal's father, lavished extravagant, extravagant goodness on the ones that betrayed him and disregarded him. Now, I'm going to be challenging you here in these closing moments. Now, just because I say closing moments, don't put your pens away in your notebook. I'm just kind of getting you ready that I'm on the other side. Because I think I have more to say, but let me say it this right now. It's going to be challenging for you right now because it's, it's not easy to get up and turn the other cheek. If you've been betrayed, if you've been despised, if you've been persecuted, if you've been ridiculed, mocked, whatever it may be, hated, it is not easy to overcome that without the grace of God. In fact, it's impossible to overcome that kind of hurt. And I know some of you have gone through immense pain and immense relational struggles and hurts and brokenness and betrayal. I know the pain of that. I've been, I've been through some of those journeys myself, but for the grace of God. For those who despitefully use you and to reconcile with them, Joseph's tears say it all. I remember standing at the altar one time with somebody who came for prayer, going through great brokenness. And the only thing I could do was hold him and weep with him. Because I knew that what he was going through was so deep and so painful that words would not have worked. And so my tears filled his shoulders and his tears filled my shoulders. And we held each other until the presence of the Lord brought peace. Without grace, you're not going to make it, folks, in this world. Joseph Tears say it all. It's, so I'll say this. Compassion is the road to better, to better relationships. Generosity is the road to a blessed life. Love is the road to a better you. I'll say that again. Compassion is the road to better relationships. Generosity is a better road to a blessed life. And love is the road to a better you. Why do I know this to be true? Well, this is going to be a very famous verse. I'll throw the whole verse on the screen for you. John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Maybe this might be new for some of you. For God so loved the world that he what? He what? He what? He gave. 
So when God said, I'm going to love the world, I'm going to love these people, the first thing he did was he gave. See the generous heart of the father for you today? He gave. And then later on, he gave to save. Let me read the whole verse. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have what? Eternal life. Please add 17 every time you do 16. Memorize this. God sent his son. This is why he sent his son right here. We, we read this. We, woo, yay. Believe. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, to judge one another, but to save the world through him. So God gave to save. Pharaoh commands Joseph in this story. I think it's absolutely fascinating. He, he commands Joseph to have authority over the finances of Egypt. Could you imagine? You write the checks. That's your job. Who, who, who'd like that job? <laughs> you get, okay, thank you, Lloyd. We'll give it to you. Over the entire nation of Egypt, with this power, Joseph burst into tears in the face of his brethren, despite how he was hated, Love went out. And Joseph, when he was on top, had the power to be vindictive and the power to get even. But rather than cut them off, he transfers blessings into them. The question for us today is, do you have the strength to allow good to come out of you? I'm telling you, I wept over this message, preparing this because this is going to break free in some of your hearts. We see the tragedy in the world because of hatred and animosity and age-old lies and fears. We as the body of Christ need to have the strength to allow good to come out of our lives, out of the church. Listen, our voice is so important right now, but more than our voice, our prayers right now to allow good to be a blessing, not just to Israel. Lord, have mercy. What's happening in Palestine? My heart breaks. Yeah, but what about, what about, forget about the whatabism. God's heart's breaking. So in Joseph, he was hated and yet love went out. And Joseph, when he was on top, he didn't seek vengeance. Anybody can be good to people when people are good to you. True? Somebody's good to you, you want to be good to them. It's awesome. By the way, as you reap what you sow, you're good to other people, guarantee God's going to make sure people are good to you. But can you show good to those who haven't shown good to you yet? Maybe you are the first responder of goodness. So do you have the strength to allow good to come out of you before good is ever done for you? My last point here is number three is, in my mind, is when we're talking about the road to better, better is an opportunity before it's an outcome. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. Therefore... I love this. As we have opportunity, sometimes you have to make opportunity, find opportunity. Therefore, as we have opportunity, maybe there's other things that are not as important, so you need to create some opportunity. As we have opportunity, let us do good to who? It's a three-letter word, all. Do you know what the Greek means, that word all? All. Everyone. All. The original language says, let us do good to all people. But I love this, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. There's a special place in our hearts for our brothers and sisters. So the plan of God depends on Joseph finding his better angels. I mentioned that earlier. Joseph found his better angels. What does that mean? This phrase was first coined, well, we think first coined by Abraham Lincoln. In one of his most famous speeches, when he was leading the U.S. nation through its most turbulent period of time in history in the Civil War of their nation, 
where war was breaking out on all sides, where death and carnage was everywhere. He spoke to the nation and he added those words, better angels, in his speech. They were not there originally. He added them just moment before his famous speech. Basically what he was saying, and I don't have time to read that whole speech because we're not here for a history lesson. Basically he was saying, when all is said and done, we will recognize the kind of people that we are as citizens of a nation, a brethren, a family. So we called upon the people to find the better angels to recognize that the civil war was fighting, you're fighting ourselves, it's family, brethren. What Lincoln was counting on is that in the worst of us, there is a better of us on the inside. That if we allow it, it will rise up and give us the opportunity to take through the turbulence of the times that we face. That not talking about the Middle East per se, but I'm talking about the turbulence in your own family relationships, in your own situations. Abraham Lincoln did not find this phrase himself. He borrowed it from Shakespeare's Othello. Anybody familiar with Othello? Written in 1603. Shakespeare writes a play, and this is a line he says in that play. I, I, I forget about the play. Just get, there you go, Othello, that's, that's an ungodly skit. Relax. I'm not endorsing Othello. Retreats are not endorsement. All right. We all wrestle, this is Shakespeare writing, we all wrestle toggling between our better and evil angels. There's this battle, this war going on with all of us. So Lincoln adopts this language, better angels. It's hard to live a life that demonstrates your better angels when you've had bad times consistently. It's hard to live a, a life to have a life where your better angels are leading is when you have a lot of bad memories. All of us have to fight every day to make the opportunity for better choices and to raise our better voices to be forgiving and to bless others. There's not a person in this room or listening online that has a life that has no complexity at all. Many times we smile while we deal with complexity by ourselves. I've been through seasons where you go to church and the best thing you can do is do a half smile. Morning. I get it. By the way, there's a lot of complicated people in this room today. Amen, brother. Ask my wife, I'm complicated. Pray for her. More than you pray for me. She's going to put up with me. No amens today, honey? Okay. <laughs> so, but let me ask all of you, God have mercy on us. On my road to better, I've had my fair share of bitter struggles to overcome. I was fired twice from the same church. I know, it's a weird story. I wanted to sneak into the sound system after hours, still have my keys, and I wanted to play P.O.D. CD. Backstabber, you liar! You know, the, you know P.O.D., you know that song? But my better angels decided that's not a good idea. I'm human, we go through difficulties. Anybody know what I'm talking about when I say P.O.D.? Am I like three people? Thank you, okay. Sound crew, obviously. But I'm not just talking about me. I know you've never had internal conflicts. It's just kind of the way you are. Your life's been great. But God's favor, grace, God's favor, and my surrender to his favor was the answer to better. I could have held on to all the bitterness I'm not just talking about that situation. I got fired from one church. There were, there were multiple things happening at the same time. I could have held on to bitter and never got better. I gave up the fight 
of my flesh to have to win, to have to be right. I'd rather have relationship than to be right. I got neither out of that (laughs) because I had a court order that forbid me to say goodbye to the 200 and 300 kids in the youth group that I was a part of. Can you imagine a youth pastor pastoring these kids for 11 years, not being able to say goodbye? The shepherd was hurting because I couldn't say goodbye properly. I gave into God's will and surrendered to God that he would take care of me. He would be my vindication. I would not seek revenge. And instead I gave sacrificially out of the little abundance that I did have, even to the ones who betrayed me. Both personally, relationally, in the church world, in that season of my life. Sonia is the only one who knows the fullness of that story how the betrayal came from all sides. And yet grace held me. Church, I know it to be real. Grace lifted me and his generous love healed me and restored me. If God can trust you with blessings, it will be demonstrated in your givings. I can't tell you how much you love God, but I can know that if you're a giver, if you're generous, if you're giving generationally, not just generously, if you're giving to help the younger generation, I'll tell you right now, some of you are sowing seeds today for a generation that's not even born yet. This church will be here long after I'm here, long after you're here, and will continue to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and hundreds and hundreds of young people and people that you never even know weren't related to you, don't even like you because you don't know you. To know you is to like you. But you are going to be giving. The pews you're sitting on were generations ago believed that a church needed to be here and they gave sacrificially because they gave generationally. It impacted them. The love of God and the grace of God impacted them so much that they built this thing in what, what, 1402? I don't know when it was built. It was something like that. Or 1603, Othello, was Shakespeare was around or something. 1477? 1877. I was off by 400 years. That's close. Young people, let me talk to you for a second. I'd love to be a giver. I love to be generous, but I don't, I can't even pay my bills. I'm not able to make it week to week. Begin with what you have. What you do have is strength and energy. Maybe you need to see some, some, no offense to the, the ushers. I'm not picking on ushers. All the ushers, I love you. I'm not picking on them. But you're looking at the ushers and go, hey, they're all old. And you go, where are the young ushers? They're you. Listen to me, young generation. It's time to connect to serving as a way of giving. And then watch God bless you and watch the blessings come. You put the house of God as a priority in your life. You watch God take care of you. You give to him, he gives to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. God will bless your life. There's all kinds of ways that we can be generous generationally. And some of you that are young need to give to the older generation. And you see them, again, no offense, Ralph and your crew are awesome. But you see them, you know, like they can't hustle down the aisle as fast as you could to seat somebody to the seat. I don't know that's a bad example. But you've got the energy and the legs. I want to thank two people who've got really young legs and good backs who carried a couch, which I thought was like 400 tons, into the church Bethany room for our new renovation. I think they're in church today, maybe, but I don't want to embarrass them. And they picked up just the two of them. I thought we needed four. I thought, I thought it was way too heavy for this old guy. And they in the truck and off to go. We need your young backs, young men. Younger people, you need to serve the older generation. Older people, thank you 
for serving the younger generation. Boy, you're giving your time, your love, your prayers. Bethany's on the precipice of a generational shift. Father, we want it. Prepare our hearts, heal our hearts, change us. So we don't just see persons and seasons, but we see nations and generations. Father, may our lives shine the glory of the Lord in all the earth through our love and our giving and our support of your kingdom work here in this, in this place. Before we do our closing song, if your loved one is with you, I want you just to join hands with them. If you have a friend with you, just... Father, I thank God for the family of God here in this place. For everyone that's missing from these united people, these families, whoever's missing, we call them forward, Lord. Whether it's an older person who through bitterness has walked away or through it's a younger person who's resented and rebelled, whatever it may be, it doesn't matter age or stage. We just pray, Father, you call them back. And may we be generational minded in our prayers. We ask this in Jesus name. I just pray that your hearts were open to receive. This was a holy, loving word from the Lord today. Yesterday, um, we met as men and uh, the Lord laid this scripture on my heart and brought it to my thoughts this morning again. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 4, 15 to 16 said, For even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you have only one spiritual father. Paul speaking. For I became your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the good news to you. So I urge you to imitate me. We may have like thousands upon, well, we have probably had thousands of teachers that have passed through our lives. But uh, a spiritual father, a spiritual mother is what this generation needs. Someone who recognizes and takes ownership of the life that God has brought to them. So I just would want to pray for you and that the Lord would lay that on your heart. And I can, I've seen this in many of you, so I know that you hear this. But that the Lord would press this upon your heart today. Let's pray. Father, um, we want a heart like yours that is tender and soft. Um, willing to welcome. And Lord, we just want your eyes to see, Lord, all the people that you have brought into our lives that you intend for us to impact and love and care for, to watch over and guide. Um, and Lord, I just pray that you would just impress that upon our hearts today. Lord, we love you. And I just pray your blessing, your healing, and your grace upon each one, Lord, that you would meet them where they are, as Pastor A has said, and that you would um, bring them back. And uh, Lord, that we would be grace-filled so that when we, like Joseph, have the opportunity to restore and to reconcile and to step into a place of grace, that we would be ready. Bless them, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>